In today's interview, I sat down with the powerful Jared James. This guy has been in the game for about as long as I have. He's been coaching for a lot longer than I have. Um, but this guy is a true pioneer in the industry. And he's a true pillar of the industry. And he's done so much for real estate agents. So this is a really good conversation. I actually reached out to him back in 2017 when I first started coaching. He got on a call with me, uh, which at the time I was like, wow, this is amazing. Um, I saw him speak at a Remax event, you know, about a year before that. Uh, that was where I first saw him. And I was like, man, this guy is the man. Um, and just been friends ever since. And uh, just have a lot of respect for him. Um, great guy. Uh, owns a lot of different companies. This guy's a true entrepreneur. Um, this is going to be one you really want to watch. He goes into how people choose an agent, his perspective on how people choose a real estate agent, which I, I found very interesting, which was kind of, you know, off the cuff, different than what you probably think he's going to say. I also talked about, we, we both talked about the fear of making calls, you know, and this fear of rejection um, that people have when they get into the business. Um, so I, I thought that part of the conversation was really cool. And then at the very end, I asked him to go into detail on ways to get deals right now in this market, really any market, but right now specifically because there's so few transactions. And he laid down three really great ideas when it comes to going out and getting more listings, uh, finding more buyers. Um, I thought that this one was a really, really good one. So you're going to enjoy it. Go ahead, click subscribe, smash the like button, all that good stuff, and shoot me a comment below. Let me know what you thought, and let's get into it. Abundant mindset, man. You're always losing something. So, so one, one or the other, right? While well, I'm losing business, well, the other side is I'm losing, I'm losing memories, I'm losing time. I got back in 08, and it was like, dude, it was like the easiest thing in the world. Right? Houses were half price. You know, people were just loving it. It was the easiest time in the world to get back in the business, and uh, I just crushed it. I'm just saying every once in a while we need we need a little bit of, of context, and we need to understand that happiness doesn't come from achieving your goals. Ultimately, it comes from the gratitude of understanding just how lucky we are to even set them. That's all that matters. At Ricky, it's high school 101, man. It all comes back to rejection. It's like we would rather fail, we would rather be unsuccessful than be rejected. I don't want 100 employees. You know, I, I know guys that are doing like 30 million, 100 million a year, 60 million a year and four sales and have businesses and millions of employees and stuff. I've got like three or four partnerships of companies that have 100, 200, 300 employees. And those employees do whatever I tell them to do. Yo. Yo, just, you know, I'm talking to my son. We're talking very important stuff of uh, we're out of ramen and chocolate syrup. Oh, it's, it's the end of the world. Yeah, exactly. Uh, remind me of that later, okay, bud? So what's happening, man? Oh, uh, not much, bro. How you doing? Really good. I'm uh, my last official week before crazy travel season. So, oh, okay. Yeah, this yeah, worked I out think perfect, I, man. I think I remember when we uh, first talked to you. Um, you like dedicated just certain months to travel and speaking and stuff, dude. Even so, so since you and I spoke then, uh, it's funny. So since you and I spoke, uh, like that was way back. Um, you know, my yeah, business like five became, years ago. Yeah, my busy season became all year long. And uh it it just got nutty, man, because it was is one of those things where it's like, oh, dates open, dates open, and then all of a sudden you look up one day and you're like, I'm on the freaking road all the time. Like I don't want to do that. And then I went through a divorce a couple years ago. Um, oh shit. Yeah, yeah, which was not a terrible thing. I said I got my son right here. Uh her and I are still very friendly. She lives right down. Like it's we're through that rough period. Uh it was just one of those deals you're with someone since you're sixteen, never really in love, you know. Um, so, so that kind of happened, but so this summer, man, I was just like, I just wanted to hang with my kids. I wanted to just kind of, you know, so we just said no to a lot of stuff, um, mm -hmm. in, in an effort to just kind of, and now I'm hitting the, the crazy season again. So it starts next week. Does it, does it, when you, when you take, when you say no and like you're, you know, you're People like, that's missed up. We should uh, we should save this for the podcast, by the way. But it is. This is we're rolling. Oh, we are. I was gonna say we should save. I do. This. I do this every time. Like I, I roll. I'm rolling. Oh, good. I was gonna say. Right. Like, this is. Awesome. Yeah. No. We're I'm talking about all this stuff beforehand, and like it doesn't. <laughs> you know. Um. I always yeah. catch everybody off guard because the best stuff. What I realized was before yeah. I say, okay, let's start. Yeah, man. I'm I'm an open book too. Like I actually like it when we talk about things outside of what are your top three recommendations for the market or whatever. 
Um, but uh, uh, what was the question you said? Uh, like when you when you're so oh, 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 or it ticks people off. It ticks people uh, off. like everybody wants you. Everybody wants to go to a class on balance. Everybody wants to tell you to learn how to say no until it's against them. Yeah. Um, you know what I mean? It, it's kind of like uh, you ever left an event and and um, you have a like a tight flight. Like literally you don't have a minute to spare. It's just like I'm in, I'm out, I got to run out of here. Mm -hmm. A lot of times I'll, I'll tell people because that's not my fault. It's just like when the flight falls, it's like, guys, just I, I warn them while I'm up there. Like I am not a jerk, but I'm just telling you guys when I leave here, like I'm out of here. Like I love to stay. I, I'm the guy that will stay as long. I'll stay all through the day taking pictures, doing, but like I got a flight you know, that I need to get back to my kids or I need to get back to whatever. And it's the syndrome where everybody's like, you know, just real quick, just real quick. So yeah. you walk into the, you know, to your car, you're rushing to a car, you have reserved, whatever. And everybody's like, real quick, quick, just real quick. I have a question real quick. I said, well, pick, you add up all of those real quicks, mm -hmm. and not get out of here quick, you know? Yeah. And yeah. so it just shows you how much everybody lives in their own world where, you know, it's like, oh no, that makes sense. Good for you. Good for you. But for me real quick, no, you can't say no. And mm -hmm. so when you start saying no to events, it was funny, man, because um, I would say we say no to 90 plus percent of stuff that comes in, right? Mm -hmm. And the initial reaction from people is kind of like, all right, well, how much for this money? How about for this much money? Well, how many? Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, you're not understanding. It's not, it's not a money play. This wasn't like mm -hmm. a negotiation tactic. This yeah. was, my kids are in high school. Um, we've only got so many more years of games. And... Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm gonna remember that, not another event, you know? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so yeah, man, people it's like rejecting a girl, right? It's mm -hmm. um, you know, they're so used to not being rejected that if you do that, it's like they go to angry quick. You know, it's just like, well, what? What do you mean? No, 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 no. Like this is and that's how event places are. And the ones I've dealt with, they they tend to be pretty good. But yeah, man, we've had uh my assistant will literally reach out and she'll just be like, you know they're not happy like they're actually like she'll show me the responses and it's mm. just you know um that's why you got to do you that's why i mean there's the only one jared james of course but i mean there are other there are other great speakers out there as well 100 percent, 100 percent. i think it's the rejection thing man i think i think people especially when they have their committees and they have selected you know they almost yeah. feel like they're like crowning you like hey <laughs> We're gonna give you this much, and we are going to allow you to come in, and it, and then when you come back and you go, hey, I can't do it. Yeah. Um, they're like, well, do we need to move the dates? Do we? It's like, no, just that time frame. I'm just not not doing events. Um, and it used to really affect me because I I'm such a I think like most people, the more we say we don't care, we really do. Um, I'm such a rare. I'm a people pleaser on one side. I don't like people to be un unhappy or un. I want to make people happy. And then on the other side, I have another side that can go a completely different direction once I get to a certain point. Um, but the one side of me that's such a people pleaser, you don't like to say no to people, especially in regards to something that is such a privilege. Mm. You know, it's like I remember the beginning, man, I remember just like trying to figure out how to get an event. I remember just like begging people and like sending everything and like having everything on hope and they pick me. And so that side of you always exists. But then there's another side that, that uh, you know, it's that whole hustle redefined thing, man. Like if you're going to hustle for events and hustle for work and hustle for whatever, you know, at the end of the day, um, none of that matters as much as my kids, you know, none of that. We all say that, but most people's actions don't align with that, you know? And I was literally just saying to my son, my son's standing right over here. And I was literally just saying to him, like, we've got event inquiries coming in for beginning of November. Mm. And I'm just like, that's soccer state cup like state final time mm -hmm. I, we don't know what that date's gonna be mm -hmm. um, I don't know if i feel comfortable booking an event um, yeah yeah because i just don't know and i yeah you know like how many times is how many times your kid's gonna play and you know once yeah like it's just like you know so it's it anyway all of that was just a long way of just basically saying you know you said how do people respond um they're not happy you know yeah they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't react well. So I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you deal with the, uh, conflict of like, you're losing business when you don't take these sure. events, right? Sure. I mean, how do you balance the conflict within yourself of, you know, does it just, is it just like, I don't care. I'm going to watch my kid. 
abundance mindset, man. You're always losing something. So, so one, one or the other, right? Well, I'm losing business. Well, the other side is I'm losing, I'm losing memories. I'm losing time, mm. you know, and, and what do you value? And I'm not saying that there's not, that there's not sacrifice. My kids have grown up with sacrifice. My kids Santa right here. Like, I mean, it's just, you know, uh, you know, you, 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 you understand this maybe more than a lot of people listening right now. There's always a sacrifice. The idea that there's not um, or that we're not built a certain way where there is sacrifice everywhere is insane. Of course there is. Um, but there's always effort too, you know, yeah. I can't deny who I am. I can't deny like, you know, how I'm built. I can't deny that, but I also need to, I can't also deny my responsibility, you know, to my children, you know? Mm. Um, and so it's, it's, it's always, it's always, a. I, I don't like the word balance cause I don't even believe in balance. Um, but for the sake of what we're talking about, it's always a balancing act of figuring out, you know, what's the right amount of throttle um, that doesn't throw you off the road. You know, how fast can you hit the corner, mm. uh, uh, you know, without without going off the cliff? Yeah. Um, you know, that's always the balancing act, you know, and and, you know, some people are evil Knievel and that's what they get their jollies on. And then there's like me and others that, that you know we're pushing the throttle in a different part of like, how do we get the most, you know, mm -hmm. um, in all areas, which is always, a you know, you don't always do it right. You don't always, um, but you know, that's not the goal. The goal is not always to, you know, the goal is not perfection. Yeah. And my, my kids are at a stage now. It's okay to walk behind, but my, my son is like trying to figure out how to get back to his, <laughs> his room. Cause I'm literally shooting this from home. Um, but anyway, man, yeah, those are the questions, by the way, I love, like it's, yeah. You know, you and I live, you know, I haven't gotten full in depth on your life, but I know you've, I know since you and I talked a long time ago, you're doing a lot more things now. Um, we live non-traditional lives. We live mm -hmm. non and so it's weird because we live in a world where, you know, we give advice on things. People follow our voices. They follow. And yet there's a lot of things that, you know, in regards to our voice, in regards, my son's standing behind the camera trying to make me laugh. Uh, there's a lot of things in regards to advice that, you know, there's certain areas that people just aren't going to be able to relate. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just, it just is what it is. And so for mm -hmm. me, it's always that balancing act of making sure that, um, you know, my head works a certain way, which is why people will even listen to me to begin with is because my head works a certain way and there's, and that's a good thing and it helps and whatever, but then also balancing the idea and, and making sure that I'm aware of the fact that in some areas, uh, I live a very non-conventional, um, I mean, my girl lives in California. I'm across mm -hmm. the country. Okay. That's not Where are you? At, you know? Where are okay. you? Uh, I live in Connecticut. I'm about an hour outside of New York City. Oh, nah. Yeah, yeah. So I'm in, I'm about as far away as you can get. And uh, a lot of flights, a lot of uh, meeting up, you know, come here, a lot of, you know, just my life's very non traditional. And yeah, that's not, it's not right or wrong that's that's you know we get these we get this it's just like being an entrepreneur it's like anything outside of nine to five it was like you're not prioritizing family you're not right you know it's just because normal people don't understand that and so from the audience's perspective they understand that they're entrepreneur like they're they're entrepreneurs yeah they always have stuff on their mind they're always doing things they're always it doesn't fit their parents you know union life that they live yeah you know so so that's where i find the places to relate is while my life is is non-conventional at the same time um entrepreneurs understand what I'm talking about from that perspective mm -hmm. because they have people around them their whole lives who are trying to tell them to get back in the box. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, this isn't normal. This isn't well, what the heck is normal, you know, and normal doesn't make a lot of people happy. It makes normal people happy. Yeah. Uh, so, but anyway. like you said, it's normal anymore, you know, like uh, more and more and more people are living these non-conventional lives now, you know, um, my dad, he, uh, he took over the sales business, you know, for me. Um, so he handles all the day to day listings and sales so I can is do that. How you did it? Now your dad is doing that? Yeah. Yeah. So my dad, so I got in in 02 and then, um, he got in in 05. So I grew up roofing houses with him. And then when I got in real estate for a couple of years and found some success, I'm like, dad, get off the roof and come, come do real estate. So he got in in like 05, right before it crashed, you know? And then we both went, worked on an oil rig for a while. We roofed some houses, kind of got through that whole rough yeah. patch and yeah. then uh, i got back in 08 and it was like dude it was like the easiest thing in the world Pri houses were half price you know people were just loving it it was the easiest time in the world to get back in the business and uh i just crushed it dude, and that, I got, that was my best year ever was 08 yeah 
It was it was it, was, it wasn't my best year ever, but it was my comeback year. It was my first year coming back after yeah. losing everything. And um, but yeah, he he uh he stayed on the oil rig till about 2010, and then again I got him back into real estate, and then we kind of had separate businesses up till last year. You know, we're kind of two separate agents, kind of doing our own thing, helping each other, consulting, but kind of having our own clients and everything, and then. I, I decided I was, you know, just burnt out on the sales part. I wanted I was to say, there's no way, because I saw what you were doing. I'm going, there's no way. I, I don't care how much he's going to tell everybody I'm going to stay in this and do whatever. <laughs> you can't, it, dude, it's just not, no matter what new app they come up with, there's they're not going to discover more than 60 seconds in a minute. Yeah. It, it just, well, it's just not going to happen. You know, like I was, I did a hundred deals a year for eight years in a row as a single agent, right. With one assistant. And then those last, the last, maybe three of those years I was doing coaching and stuff like 50% of my time on this and 50% of my time on my business. Yeah. I just got to the point where I just was cringing every time a client was calling and I was like, okay, it's time to just let this go because at that point just went, your interest went elsewhere. Like it, it, like for me, at least like I saw not to make this all whatever, but I saw a higher purpose. Um, uh-huh. And I want to be clear when I say that, because like if you're an agent out there selling houses, that does not mean that my purpose is higher than yours. You know, what it means is that um, on a chessboard, there are different pieces and that no piece is going to be as happy doing somebody else's moves. They're not even allowed to do it, right? Mm-hmm. So our job is to figure out, you know, what piece we are, you know, whether it's a pawn, a king or something in between, it doesn't matter because you're never going to be as happy trying to make the moves that are somebody else's moves, you know? And that's really how I looked at it. I'm like, this is how we got here. This is how, you know, whatever. But ultimately I just felt like there was, I felt like I could have more impact. I felt like I'd stepped into, mm-hmm. you know, my calling. I stepped into my gifts. I stepped into all of those things. It wasn't a, it wasn't a shot against the real estate. I love, I still miss it sometimes. And I love that I get to be, yeah. I, get, I love that I get to be in it with people and still seeing what's going on and still working with people and, and all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But you're never going to be as happy doing you know what it is you're meant to do you know that's it yeah i uh i when i got to that point i realized okay there's different chapters here because like every agent i talk to is like i love sales i'm gonna do sales forever yeah and i'm like yeah you will until you until you're not (laughs) until you get to the point where you just don't want to do it anymore and you need to be kind of setting yourself up long before that to uh yeah. to be able to transition out to where okay now you're yeah. selling because you want to not because you have to so yeah anyway we got to that point and we worked out a deal he handles the day-to-day now and we were talking the other day you know we go to the gym every morning together you know yeah. and we i still do the marketing oh, and nice. you know we're, we're working real side by side and we're really more now than ever yeah um before it was two separate businesses and now it's, you know, was one, but you know, I had thatch win, you know, thatch the, or the Vietnamese, uh, investor, real estate investor type guy. He's got a million followers on Instagram. I don't know if you've seen him. He's, he's really cool, but he came from, from Vietnam when he was five. His father was in the, uh, the U S military there as a translator and they tipped his, they tipped him off that it, the country is going to be invaded and got him out of there and his family. And they went to San Diego when he was five. And uh, now he's got over a hundred million bucks worth of real estate. He became an agent in 1990, you know, and crushed it and then started yeah. buying properties and stuff. Yeah. Um, but we were, we were talking about like our, your, he was, he was like your worst day. People's worst day in America is a yeah. million times better than people's yeah. best day in some of these other villages and stuff around the world. Yeah. And me and dad were talking and he was, he was like, son, cause he grew up roofing houses and like just poor, right. North Alabama. And he was like, he, he was like, man, I never imagined living like this. You know, he lives in a nice house. Um, you know, he makes money just selling properties, you know, just tons of money. Yeah. And he was like, man, this is like more than I ever, imagine you know life would be yeah well i mean not only that it's just where where we are as a world you know where we are as a country like people yeah. complain about u.s and stuff but i mean bro i think we're sitting here you know, you know, about the u.s i i think it's absolutely yeah, no no not you i know you don't 
But that's my point, though. The U.S. is freaking amazing. Like, there's a lot of problems, a lot of whatever. But, yeah, go somewhere else, and you'll see. Dude, we're just living this, like, dream life. <laughs> you know? Yeah, man, I mean, our biggest, our biggest issue is, you know, our laptop's not charging. You know? It was... Uh, I, I, said this, I said this at an event a couple of years ago. I, I should probably bring this back, actually. But, um, you know, I said happiness doesn't come from achieving your goals. Happiness comes from the gratitude of understanding how freaking lucky you are to even set goals to begin with. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and what I meant by that was, you know, we, we have all these agents we're working with and all of these people who are, you know, getting depressed because a deal fell apart and then getting happy because one happened or whatever. But at the end of the day, like, think about it. Like there's some kid working for 30 cents an hour in some country that he didn't choose to be born in, didn't choose this life, didn't choose anything. Mm-hmm. We're over here doing business planning sessions to try to figure out how many hundreds <laughs> of thousands or millions we should put as a goal. <laughs> and, you know, I know I hate to laugh, but it's and, funny. And, like, think about it. We have the audacity to, you know, I always say there's a big difference between busyness and business, right? Busyness, B-U-S-Y, business, B-U-S-I. And, you know, we are a, we're a, a society, a culture of, of agents. I mean, we, we could go even much broader, but we're just talking agents right now. Uh, we're, we're a society of agents, culture of agents that, you know, we're all busy, but we're all getting different results because, you know, many of them don't want to prospect. They don't want to do this. They don't want to do that. Like mm. just the fact that you get to choose to not mm. do something and then complain mm. about what you're not is just mind blowing. Like there is a, yeah. there's a woman right now laying on her deathbed, knowing that she has 60 seconds left to live and hoping that her son gets there in time so she can say goodbye and kiss him on the forehead. And then there's an agent sitting around searching Facebook, just looking at the next meme for the next 60 seconds. Yeah, well... Those two different people are handling time right now way different, and I'm not saying that we need to look at it like the person. I'm just saying every once in a while we need... We need a little bit of, of context and we need to understand that happiness doesn't come from achieving your goals. Ultimately, it comes from the gratitude of understanding just how lucky we are to even set them. Like, that's all that matters. Well, we still yeah. we win. We already won. That's it. Mm. Yeah, that's good. I, I People are like, or, or brokers will come to me and say, how do I get my agents to make calls? And I'm like, tell them to go get a job. Tell them to go work at McDonald's or serve tables or roof houses or paint houses or frame or do landscaping or do something like that because you're out there in the hot sun doing hard labor, yeah. right, on one hand. And the other hand, literally, the, the most physical thing you're doing is just lifting your arm up to your – or you don't even do that anymore with auto divers and stuff. You're literally yeah. just sitting like this. They ever on your seat, man. Your finger muscles are the only things growing. Yeah, Ricky, it's high school 101, man. It all comes back to rejection. It's like we would rather fail, we would rather be unsuccessful than be rejected. You yeah. know, like we we like my new thing I've been the last year, it, I have certain things that are like my cornerstones, like throughout the year I'll just kind of come up with these are my bullet points, my main cornerstones, and one of them is, you know, I tell people that uh it is our responsibility, it's our job to give people the chance to know us, K-N-O-W, so they have a chance to know us, N-O. Yeah. Right? That's our job. You got to give people a chance to know you, K-N-O-W, so they have yeah. a chance to know you, N-O. Our job mm. is to get notes. And mm. in the meantime, we are missing out on and not making calls, not doing whatever it is we need to do because somebody who's never thought of us, doesn't know who we are, won't know who we are three seconds from now, is going to say no and never think of us again and in the meantime, we give up on every bit of potential, every bit of ability to take care of our families, every bit of ability to save and be able to make good decisions, every bit of ability because of rejection from somebody who we don't know, doesn't know us, and will never think of us again. When you start to put it in perspective, it's just like, what, what are we doing? You know, we live in the gold mine, and yet most agents live paycheck to paycheck. Like, well, it's sad. I mean, the entire business is predicated on you talking to someone you don't know. To help them buy and sell real estate. Yeah. And the one thing that the business is predicated on, you don't want to do. Yeah. <laughs> it's wild. It, man, we, we, um, so, so I always say visibility trumps ability, right? And, uh, we've got an event coming up where I'm going to, I'm going to kind of go a little bit further with that. I'm going to talk about how visibility not only trumps ability, visibility is our responsibility. Like, let's not overcomplicate mm-hmm. this business. It's not that difficult. You know, if I see one more session, 90 apps in 90 minutes, I'm going to throw up in my mouth. 
you know, uh, at the end of the day, yeah, there's good strategies. Yeah, there's a lot of different things we can teach. Yes, things change, no doubt about it. But at the end of the day, certain number of people sell, certain number of people buy. The only question is who's going to be on that contract, whose name is going to be on it, who's representing them. How do you get in front of people? How do you know them? That's our responsibility, visibility. So whether it's through calls, whether it's through the content you create, whether it's through the networking you do, uh, whether whether it's through whatever you're going to do, it doesn't happen by sitting back and hoping your phone rings. That's mm. never going to work. Yeah. No, no, no. I always say, think of yourself as a volunteer worker, you know, community outreach to see what you can do to help the people in the community, you know, using your services. That's it. So true. By the way, if you believe you're the best option, you're doing them a disservice by not being an option. You know, if you say I'm better than this person and they're about to buy and someone in your area is about to buy the, the largest asset they're ever going to own during the third most stressful time in their life, death, divorce, and moving, and you're doing anything outside of being available and being an option for that person um, to during their most stressful time of their life, well, then you're doing a disservice letting them work with someone who you yourself are saying they're not going to do as good a job as me, right? You know what I used to do, man? I, I used to actually go and take, um, this was what I would do to motivate myself, right? When I was selling, right? And I look at the coaching world like this right now too, is I would actually go and I would look at um, how many, how many. I would look up in the MLS, I would look up how many transactions have happened in the last 12 months in my market area, whatever that market area was, the cities I yeah. covered, the, whatever it was. I would look it up and I would look up the total mm -hmm. number of sales in the last 12 months, right? And then I would subtract the total number of sales that I did, right? And then I would look at that number left over and I would go, why? Mm. Why did all of those people buy and sell and didn't use me? Mm. And there's a certain number of them that, yeah, they had a brother in the business, they had a friend, they had a whatever. But you know the reason the majority of the time? They just didn't know you. Wasn't an option. I didn't give them a chance to know me, K-N-O-W, so they had a chance to say no to me, N-O, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so ultimately, that's what it came down to. And that's uh, no matter what business you're in, whether you're in real estate, whether you're in coaching training, whether you're in a tech business, whatever, at the end of the day, man, visibility, visibility, that's it. Yeah, yeah. What do you think the number one reason people choose an agent is? Uh, well, to me, that people aren't going to like this answer um, because it, it doesn't fit the, you know, they got to like you, trust you, and know you. And by the way, all this stuff's very true. But I think the number one re reason or the number one uh, factor of why people make decisions, ease of use. It's, mm -hmm. the, it's the same reason why referrals are number one, because mm -hmm. it's ease of use. It's the same reason why Uber beats taxi. Yeah, yeah. Uber's yeah. more expensive than taxi, right? Mm -hmm. But it's ease of use. You're not standing outside going, next, you, you vacant, not vacant, what's going on? No, you get a thing that goes, your driver has arrived. Awesome. Right. Hey, everybody, see ya. We're good to go, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so um, I know that everybody wants me to do the whole like you, trust you, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. Look, that stuff matters. There's no doubt about it. Um, but the reason anybody makes any decisions, ease of use. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the reason the reason why we go in for, you know, milk and bread in a store and it's at the back of the store is because they know that along the way you're going to see a bunch of other things. And because mm -hmm. it's available and in front of you, you're going to buy those other things. You didn't even mm -hmm. need them at that moment. It's just ease of use, right? The easier you can make it for people to work with you. Uh, you know, I use, I was just joking with my son beforehand about Instacart. You know, I'll pay more, have the groceries delivered. I'm not going to. Um grocery store you know like i, I want yeah. ease of you my whole life is ease of use mm -hmm. and everybody on some level subscribes to that you know whether they do it at my level where i try to leverage everything mm -hmm. or whether they do it uh on the level of you know a single mom trying to whatever we're all just looking for ease of use right so how does that would it have, put that into context for choosing an agent visibility you got to be an you option yeah, just that they saw that. you, they saw an advertisement, a postcard, got a uh, an email or something like that. You just happen to be there at the right time, or here you go. Um, okay, another principle, another thing, another thing that that, that I've taught since the beginning of time. Right, you, you got to marry the principle, date the model. Um, and and what does that mean? You know, principles are tried and true; they don't end. You know, back when my mother was an agent and I was her unpaid assistant. Um, the principle was the idea that of getting in front of someone at the time that they need you before a competitor. Okay. That's the principle that lasts then. And it lasts now 
you 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 date the model, you date the prince, uh, the the strategy, meaning how you get in front of them. Whether it was the phone book back then, and now it's social, whatever it is, right? But when you say, well, how do you do that? And I say, well, it's visibility. What I say in the beginning, you said you marry the principle, get in front of someone at the time they need you before a competitor, ease mm -hmm. of use. So what does that mean? That means that a certain number of people, just like kernels of popcorn throughout the year, we don't talk people into buying or selling. That's not how it works. Okay. Like they're going to do it. They're not going to do it. It's just a matter of who they're going to use. But when they pop and they're ready, now the question becomes, who's the easiest option? Who's in front of me? Who's showing up on my phone? Who did my friends use? What showed up at the right time in the mail? Who called me at the right time? Who was standing at that open house? And everything is about visibility at the right time, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's mm -hmm. really what it comes down to. If, if, if I'm looking for like any product, any service, if I'm looking for a, I'm looking for a chiropractor and I run into a chiropractor at some family gathering, more than likely I'm going to use that chiropractor. I'm not looking for a chiropractor. We're just going to have a very boring conversation about him doing chiropractic stuff. Okay? Yeah. But the timing mattered with when you blend that with the visibility. So what happens is you put out enough visibility that other people's timing matches the visibility, right? Mm -hmm. And that is 99% of your visibility that doesn't matter at that moment. And guess what that's called? It still works. That's called branding. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so the part that people miss when I talk about visibility, or let's just talk marketing 101. There's two main purposes of marketing, right? One is direct call to action. That's the one that all agents love. That's a direct lead immediately. Give me your name. Give me your whatever. That's one form or one, one purpose of marketing. But the other purpose of marketing is branding. And that's the one that people don't love enough. Yeah. But the, the point of branding, even though it might not immediately deliver something right now, is that everything else that you, everybody else you come in contact with from that point on becomes an easier sale. You know, mm -hmm. when I get in front of an audience, uh, like I did last week, that was my first event I had done in months, whatever. And at the beginning of the event, I'm like, how many of you are familiar with me? And almost every single hand goes up. That's the easiest event on planet Earth. Because mm -hmm. like, I know you, I watch you, I, I yeah. get you, I like you, like we're good to go. Mm -hmm. You walk into a listing presentation and they go, oh, you, I watch your videos. Like you, mm -hmm. you got to win already, right? Yeah, yeah. So planning is just as effective, if not more effective. It's just not as immediate. It, mm -hmm. it's, it's mm -hmm. delayed gratification in that sense, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, visibility, man, our job is to plaster our world, to plaster our local markets with visibility. You know, mm -hmm. now it's just a matter of their timing matching up with that. But we're going to supply the option for it. So is that another word for omnipresent? Sure. Sure, man. You got to I... mean, Here's the deal, man. Like, so, so, so you and I, man, like my, my, my market is the world. That's much more difficult. Mm. A local agent, yeah, their market, not only is it so freaking small, mm -hmm. you're surrounded by a bunch of people who don't want to do it. You know, you're surrounded by a bunch of people who are afraid of video, afraid of saying yeah. the wrong thing, don't deliver enough, afraid of screwing up. What's everybody going to say? What's everybody going to, you know, being perfect, 27 different angles, what filter works, what, what microphone do I use? What lighting do I use? What kind of camera... You're surrounded by all these people like that, that if you would just take this freaking thing and be consistent, you know, we yeah. have time consistency is undefeated. Consistency is undefeated. It's so easy to dominate a local marketplace. It mm -hmm. really is. If you yeah. just be consistent and that's the part where it's just most agents just don't, it's the thing that scares them is what scares everyone else. And rather than that, turning them on and going, this is where I get ahead because this is where everybody else got afraid too. Instead of having that mindset, they're like, oh, let me just go back into, let me just try what I was doing. Let me just, I'm kind of happy with my life. Kind of, I've kind of done a consistent bit. If I just stick with that, I'm okay. There's, that's the safer place, you know? It's like going back to a bad relationship. It's not the worst thing in the world. It's not great, but at least I know what it is. It's comfortable. This fear of rejection and, uh, you know, procrastination and, um, are you empathetic to this? Of course, is the all epidemic. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So here's the difference. Here's the difference between what you and I have to be the difference as. I, I I believe the reason that you and I are so effective, um, is because we do understand. Um. So the only reason I can talk as strongly as I do, and that I can be as upright and forthright as I am with people, is because I understand their struggle. So there's empathy in understanding um how difficult it is to be consistent. There's empathy in understanding 
how difficult it is to come up with what you want to say or what's the repercussions going to be or caring about what other people are going to think um, or struggling with, you know, your health or struggling with, um, you know, your local reputation. Like the only reason that it works for me and I can talk like I do is because I've, I experience it. And not only do I experience it all the time, but I overcome it. So, so for me to look at someone and say, Hey, that's bull crap. We gotta, we gotta do this because, because I've faced it today. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like I today didn't want to go for a run. I had the same mm -hmm. feelings everybody else had, you know? Uh, yeah. and it, it really breaks it down to that, that little, that small, like I feel it every day, but I overcome it every day. And sometimes I don't, you know, sometimes I screw up and that doesn't end up as an Instagram post or mm -hmm. whatever. But that's what gives me empathy is that guys, we're all, we're all traveling, you know, down the mm -hmm. same highway. We're just getting in different lanes, you know, based yeah. on decisions, you know? What about the, the fear and procrastination that never leads to anything, right? That, that they, they allow it to, um, consume them so much that they, they end up just never doing anything and just yeah. quitting completely yeah. quitting. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, in a world where, okay, they're going to have to go back to a nine to five. They're going to have to go back to serving right. tables, roofing houses, something like that. And it's almost like you're okay with that. That's it, man. It's right. It's like this misdirected fear because look, we all have fear. We all have absolutely. Right. But the only thing we recognize is what we focus on, you know? And so what I try to do when you have people with that, what I call misdirected fear, right? It's like, let's go back to your original example, fear of rejection. Don't want to make calls. Don't want to make whatever. Awesome. Well, let's look at the alternative. Here's the alternative. Um, you're going to be embarrassed uh, because you're going to go into debt. You're not going to do well. You're going to have to get another job. Your family's going to not be able to go on vacation. Or if they do, you're going to have to be in extreme debt and do, you know, like that should be more fearful to you. So, so we have a thing right now. My whole thing right now is pros versus amateurs, right? That's the whole theme of our conference. That's all I've been talking about at events is just pros versus amateurs. And my whole thing is like a lot of people right now, they don't want to practice because they feel stupid and they don't want to practice in the mirror. They don't want to practice with their coach. They don't want to, because they're going to feel stupid. And, and my whole thing is there only one thing that should make you feel more stupid than that. And that's underperforming in this industry. So you got to choose your stupid. I, I can either feel stupid practicing, practicing in front of my coach, practice, or I can get the stupid that comes with underperforming in the greatest industry that ever was, the one that produces more millionaires, more, more financial security than any other industry ever. I can underperform in that industry. So one or the other, you're going to get one of these stupids. You just got to choose which stupid it is that you're going to feel. And I know which one gives you a better result. Yeah. Some, sometimes agents will come to me and they'll say, I'm about to get foreclosed on and uh, all this stuff. And, you know, when? Oh, like in the next 30 days. And I'm like, well, you should have called me six months ago, number one. But are, are you making calls? Are you posting videos? Are you doing anything? Yeah. You know? And they're like, no. And yeah. I'm like, you're about to lose your house. You know, and then some agents, I'll say, they'll, they'll ask me this. And I'm like, OK, well, do you have kids? Do you have a family? Yeah. You know, and if not, it's like, do you have a dog? Do you have anything? Do you have, do you have a mom, a dad, anybody? Right. Yeah. Like, how are you going to go home every day and look at your, look your kids in the eyes, knowing that you didn't, you know, because of a little uncomfort that you didn't do what you needed to do to provide the best possible life for them because of what? And then you ask them what they're scared of. You know what the most common answer is? Rejection. What? They say, I don't know. I'm like, what? I'm like, what are you so scared of? I don't know. I don't know. Literally nine out of 10 times they say, I don't know. Yeah. And then I say, well, is it rejection? They're like, well, yeah, I guess so. But they don't even know what they're scared of. Yeah. <laughs> That's the crazy thing. Going yeah. back to your um, traveling and speaking and kids and stuff. I'm lu real lucky right now because uh, my daughter's three. As I was say, you had a kid, right? Yeah. And we go like two or three times a month and they come with me. Nice. So they've been coming with me and we've been going two or three times a month. Just how do you all the worry so you can do that because she's not in school. I can do that now. Yeah. Yeah. I, so I don't, I don't know, know what that looks like, like in two years. Cool. Yeah. Like it's like yeah. It, uh, yeah. That's why I say I'm super fortunate right now. I was going to say you're coming up on you're going to have to figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. I know. That, that, I'm going to be in your boat uh, turning people down. 
Yeah, but well, even even look, man. Even if you're not like. Okay, so my schedule's like nutty, right? It's nutty, like whatever. But even if it wasn't that nutty, just doing, even if you were just doing, I don't know, like I don't know what's normal, but if you're doing, uh, I don't know, four to eight, uh, not even, let's just say uh, four events a month. I don't know, I don't know what normal is. So I'm just trying to, so like four events a month or something, it's still a challenge. Like it's still, there's always something that you're going to miss. You know, there's always something because you book these things out so far in advance and you can do everything yeah. in your power to try to figure out like, okay, you know, that's when that happens. Here's first day of school. Here's this, here's that. Here's, here's always stuff that comes up, you know? And so yeah. it's, it's definitely something you're going to have to figure out because, um, you either don't do it or, you know, you get on the same page with your spouse and you're like, this is part of what I, this is part of my calling this is part of whatever. And like I said, sacrifice is part of anything. Like, mm. you know, you're either sacrificing that or you're staying home and you're sacrificing the potential income and impact and, you know, whatever. But you got to get on the same page about that because there's always going to be sacrifice. And if you're not on the same page for that sacrifice, that causes a big riff. You know, it's. Oh, yeah. Especially once, especially once you got her home taking care of the kid while you're out there. Mm. It looks glamorous. Like you're out there. <laughs> everybody loves you. Yeah. And, you know, mm. have fun with that. You know, that that's that's the. Yeah. Yeah. You know, mm. uh, which there's some of that. There's no doubt, but there's a whole lot of you know when you're traveling, man. Which I don't mind. It's a lonely road. It's me. Oh, yeah. I love being in my hotel room. I like I go to dinner places away from the event. I don't like mm -hmm. my friends are all like, "Oh, isn't it great? You run into all these people, and everybody wants to come over and see you and whatever." And I'm like, "This sounds so bad, by the way." But it it's just I'm just being honest. It's like no, no, it's not because you just you hit a point where like I'm a natural introvert, you know, like I naturally right. just like to, you know, I know how to turn it on mm. or whatever, but, uh, mm. I just like, I love going places where nobody knows me, nobody, nothing, just sit at a bar, banter with the bartender, have nothing going on, mm -hmm. just, just chill. Like that's my favorite yeah. thing in the world, you know? Um, but yeah, you're going to have to figure that out. Cause that's, that is common. What will they say? Game of Thrones? Yeah, we're pretty good. We're, we're on the same page with stuff. I have no problem turning turning events down, honestly. <laughs> I mean, you know, they're great and everything, but I mean, I mean, you, dude, I'm getting more views on my social than most national, you know. News so you're networks. making the argument. You're making the argument that I was. So I agree with you to an extent because I almost stopped doing uh, events. Um, our uh, so I went and I talked to our director of coaching, and I was like, "Hey, I'm gonna stop doing live events, whatever," because I was just. I don't live for the road. I'm also not a like a like an ego in the everybody has to have an ego. You can't succeed without an ego, right? But I'm not an ego in the sense of like I need I don't like attention in public. I don't like whatever. So like I don't need the stage. It's not like um I'm not up there because, you know, someone didn't love me enough or something. Like I, I don't I don't need the stage at all, right? I love what I do. I love, you know, having an effect. I love all that stuff, but I don't need it. And so I went and I was like, I'm going to stop doing, uh, you know, we're getting enough off of social and online and our website and all that stuff. And our director like basically pleaded with me. She's like, you can't do that. Like, it's just, you know, when you go there, it's different live and, and you're seeing our students in person and relationships. And I didn't, I didn't disagree with her, which is why I didn't stop doing it. And I also, I think if COVID taught us anything, um, there's a difference between going to a concert and watching a YouTube video. Mm -hmm. You know, there's something about that live component, you know, that, that I wish it wasn't the case because it's, well, it's not it's the energy. Cool. Yeah, man, it's different. Like when you see someone and you hear mm -hmm. them, you, mm -hmm. you know, to shake that hand and you're like face mm -hmm. to face and it's just different, you know, you see how tall they are and you realize, yeah, oh, yeah they're shorter yeah. than me. I, it's just, this guy. <laughs> It's just different, man. It's like I said. I mean, I can I can watch a concert on YouTube all day long, man. But when yeah. you're at a con, it's just a different thing, you know. So yeah. I made the point to like leave that leave that open is like a thing that we do. But I did. Uh, I limited it from where it was going a couple of years ago because it was getting yeah better. yeah just more selective, more strategic on which ones, you know. Like I'm going yeah, to Sarasota to speak at. Huh? What'd you say, Sarasota? What? I'm going to Sarasota in a couple of weeks to speak at the Board of Realtors. I don't know, maybe a couple hundred agents, 300, yeah. three, 350 or something. Yeah. They're paying my travel and all that, and it's awesome. I've never been there. We'll hang out. I'll take the fam. We'll go there for a day and stuff. But I'm just thinking, like, stuff like that, I won't be doing those kind of events, you know. So wait, you're going, um, I don't know if you want to talk about that on here or not. So you're going just for travel. 
like travel expense. Yeah. Dang. Good. The, on that, on that, on that one. Yeah. On that one. Uh, there, there's there's a pick up some, some kind of offshoot, whatever they join your stuff. They do your like that. Kind of yeah, stuff. exactly. 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 So a lot of my stuff right now, I'm getting paid on some, but most of it's just travel, which is fine because it's not just me. I make them yeah. pay for my whole family for several days, you know, yeah. for three or four days, hotel yeah. and everything. It's like they're paying for the whole family vacation, not just yeah. me in and out right so it's a little bit different but i always get all the uh contacts you know of everybody that goes yeah and then i get them in my thing and then you know the database is where it's at my stuff. That's all that yeah. like, i'm gonna tell you i'm gonna tell you two things number one uh you know what's funny is it's such a, an oxymoron but like look i love doing right like if i'm at you know uh the most recent one i was at with remax right you got ten thousand people in an arena right mm-hmm. awesome great and love it. Like, it's fantastic. There's a different, it's d- different energy, no doubt about it, but it's a performance. Like, it's different, right? Mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. love, like, my favorite thing in the world is going and doing, uh, like, what I did uh, last week, which mm-hmm. was, I don't know, maybe 250, 300 people in the room. Mm-hmm. And there's no big stage. There's no bright mm-hmm. lights. You can't see anybody. You just get to kind of walk around and riff. Mm-hmm. Like it's kind of like that's my favorite thing in the world mm-hmm. because that is where you get the full like how my head works like like mm-hmm. like that's where I feel mm-hmm. like I'm made for it like I can go yeah there, yeah yeah you're a little looser you just not a performance talk, it's a not a more. I've got 37 minutes to the dot in front of all yeah these. not that kind of it's like you got two and a half yeah. hours and yeah this is the general topic and now I can mm-hmm. kind of read everybody and be like no go in that direction hey go you know whatever that's my favorite thing to do the only problem is is again from a scalability standpoint and i'm talking about things i don't do yeah myself, it's just true like from a scalability standpoint you can't do i don't want to do a million of those because it's just it's not scalable you know it's not that's like, what i'm saying yeah so you do those to kind of like build up your it's almost like a stand-up well those are like the, i like to call those the the ricky events right the ricky the ricky uh the ricky events because it's like they're all ricky followers right like every single person has been following me for a long time three or four hundred agents in a room and it's just lit like they're just screaming i can't believe you're here and it's like and then you can really just let go i'm like the only speaker let me talk for two hours do q a yeah, yeah, yeah those yeah. are my favorite too but like you say it's just like shit you leave for a week you know you talk to 350 agents who already knew you it's awesome i was about to say you know, my, you know my favorite audience is uh my favorite favorite audience and i mean this is one with a high percentage who don't follow you or don't have great context or don't have mm-hmm. you know whatever it is like those those are my mm-hmm. absolute like favorite audiences because those types of audiences mm-hmm. are i feel like it's just pure like i feel like it's just like one of those things where it's just um it's all new. It, there's there's no preconceived notions. Um, mm. uh, there's so much. I feel like there's so much good I can do. Meaning, like even when it comes to the to the to the basis or, or the or the the foundation of the things I believe and the things I can impart and the things that they don't even have that that there yet. They don't have that as like as uh, contextually yet. And so I love that man. Like I love an audience where it's just new. It's just you would think mm-hmm. I joke around a lot with the audience, like an audience like that. Mm-hmm. I'll joke around about how I'm hurt and I'll keep going back to it, have fun with it and whatever. But it's 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 honestly my favorite. It's it's mm-hmm. the best. uh uh it's preferable actually. Um I love it. I saw you first the very first time was at Remax. It was a breakout session back in 2017-ish Dang. or so. It was this big room. There was no stage. There was oh, like four hundred. What you were with Remax? I forgot. Yeah. That. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I was there for ten years. I was the number one Remax agent in Alabama for like three or four years, and I finally went to an R four. Yeah, I didn't go for. I only went because I was getting into coaching and trying to learn like speaking and how it all yeah. worked. I never went to. I never had coaches. I never went to seminars or yeah. any of that stuff. Yeah. Uh, which is probably a. Uh, a fault a weakness of mine i should have went to stuff i probably would have progressed a lot quicker but anyway i didn't and i started going when i wanted to start coaching and start to learn that side of the game and stuff and so you were there and uh was there because i think the next speaker was like video or something i can't remember how the whole thing played out but your talk was on um i don't know if you remember the the uh 
the the talk, but it was there was like a room of five hundred agents. There was no stage. You were literally standing on the floor. I like right that. that's yeah. in this room. Yeah. And um your talk was like what I got out of your talk was that, you know, X amount percentage of people are, you know, searching online for agents. Right. Basically. Like more and more percentage or, right. you know, th this this online it's crazy thing. We even had to cover that, but yeah. What's that? I said it's crazy we even had to cover that because it's just a known <laughs> thing. But like think about it, like five, six, seven years ago, like that was hey guys, this is where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. Guys, this is what they're, and you would see people in the audience like, what? What? Like, it's crazy to even think that, but it wasn't that long ago where that was the case. Well, I think too, like even right now, isn't it like, uh, well, I saw a stat that like 10% of agents actually use social media. Uh, I, I think it's even, I, was, I was just looking at a slide because I, we have all these, uh, we were just going over all these stats on, on what percent actually are on. So there's stats on how many are on there. And, and then there's, even when you take those stats, now you got to get even deeper into, uh -huh. well, great, you're on there. Yeah. That yeah. doesn't mean, it was so, so, so for example, I think it was something like 48% um, uh, of agents, you know, have a YouTube channel or something like that, right? That yeah. does not mean that they're using YouTube. You know, right. right. Just they're just there watching content. Most yeah, they heard someone who went, oh, you know, if I want to listen to Jared, I got to go sign up on YouTube or I got to, you know, whatever, like, actually leveraging it you start getting lower and lower but anyway anyway yeah, so that yeah. Session. oh yeah yeah no 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 i was at that and i was like incredibly impressed i was like oh man jared's the man kind of deal and then uh then i got into then i you know that started to progress in the coaching world i think i had a book written at that when time or whatever talk? and then and that's when i reached out to you i reached out to you at some point and then um i was like can we hop on a call or yeah. something and we just hopped on a call and you just like gave me some advice from like, uh, you know, from, from, yeah. you know, you know, mentor to you know, sensei to student, like, you know, here's some coaching advice type stuff, which was, which I remember. And it was, uh, really cool, you know, like, that, wow, that this guy, yeah, this you know, was, that was, I remember, I remember that. And, and, uh, the truth is and you probably get a lot of this now, like, I don't jump on with everybody who reaches out. That's not possible. Uh, mm. it's not possible. You're probably better with that than I am. I'm, I'm, uh, for a lot of reasons, uh, 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 part of it is just my solo nature. Um, I really don't, I don't talk to a lot. Like I got my kids, I got my girl, I got my, my teen, mm -hmm. like whatever, but like, I'm very like solo. Right. But every once in a while I'll do that when I, f I, f I feel like you reached out a couple of times, I'd looked at your stuff and I looked like, it looked like you were actually like, you were legit, like you wanted this, like this was like, you know, whatever, because the last thing you want to do is meet with someone and find out that you're just absolutely wasting your time. You know, it's just like, mm -hmm. what are we doing here? Right. So I remember that. I remember getting on with you and kind of talking about a lot of things we talked about, talking about how do you get in front of events? How do you get in front of this? How do you get in front mm -hmm. of whatever? Mm -hmm. And quite honestly, the reason I still do that to this day with some people is because, um, it was what I wish someone would have done with me in the beginning, mm -hmm. because I can remember when I first started out and it was just all a blur. I, I knew that I wanted, I knew where I wanted to go. Uh, I knew that I had the wherewithal and that, you know, I had what it took from, from that perspective. Um, but what I didn't know was the practical of how you actually get there. And everybody I would reach out to had nothing to like, they wouldn't reach back out. I wasn't big enough mm -hmm. for them to talk to me. I wasn't, you know, whatever. And so I always promised myself that if and when that day came, um, I would, uh, in the right situation, you can't go to everybody, but I would try to be to someone else what 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 people weren't to me. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Well, yeah, I remember that conversation, man. That was uh, it's longer ago than I thought. But holy yeah, crap. it was like five years ago because I started doing all this back in 17 and, um, I, uh, and I was just trying to figure out how to get on stage. I thought I like, I thought that was my thing. Yeah. So I was posting on social and doing that. And I figured, and, and you, I, you actually had a hand with, with, um, somewhat, I can't remember if it was directly through you or if it was just kind of like a reference type basis, but I got in with Matt Figioli. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I remember. Yeah. That. And like I did like twenty yeah. I did like twenty explodes. Like yeah. I did like I traveled with them and did like twenty I explodes. Completely and forgot about that. That yeah. connection with Matt. That's too funny, man. Yeah. That's yeah, awesome. like 20 and that was your first place to kind of like getting out and like actually 
It was. The audience. Yeah. I mean, I had like a couple of like little boards that had me speak and stuff, but like the explode was like the one that like, cause like I would go to those and there would be like 500 agents, one event, and then like a hundred agents the next, and then 300 the next. How did you react the first time? Because everybody reacts different. Like the first time you're in front of like 500 people, was it, did did it take you a moment? Get this. Okay. If you want, if you want to know that story. So what happened was, is Remax, my very first talk, was Remax, um, I forget the name of the event they did, but they did this thing every year. And it was, uh, it was in Biloxi, Mississippi, and it was for a region or whatever. And there was like there was like nine speakers. All right. And they asked me to speak, and I'm like, yeah, because this was right when I was like thinking about really doing this. Yeah. And I was like, sure. I just said yes. Dude, I never wear a suit at all. All right. I showed up in a suit, right? I uh I was the last speaker. They had me the last speaker of like a eight hour event with like. By the way, I think that's the worst spot. Just so you know, they think that it was favor. I hate that spot. It was it was the worst spot for my first one. I love it now, but like I'm sitting there all day just listening to these speakers and like. I mean, it was very nerve wracking. I'm sitting there all day just watching. Was it like, was it like scaring you? Like from the perspective, oh crap, that guy's good or that girl's good or that, you know, like what was that? Um, honestly, I'd went over my speech so much that, and I didn't know how good it was going to be or was it, but I was listening. uh, This is how I honestly felt when I was listening to other speakers. I was like, they haven't said anything. I, I can't tell you how often I think that, by the way, like, and again, I'm not going to name anybody and I don't want to come off as whatever, but like. I listen to some people and there's like, there's no substance. Like you might as well be getting up there and say, you know, think big and then think bigger, you know, cause <laughs> it's just like, there's just no substance here. Like if yeah. I'm a girl, think about how weird it is for a group of adults to sit there silent and listen to another adult. Like that's mm-hmm. weird on a level that we never pay attention. <laughs> it's just like, how weird is that? Right. But if you're going to do that, like, can I get something substantive that you didn't just read from a book or hear on YouTube where mm-hmm. you're just gurgitating some motivational thing that you heard and, you know, you're Matt Foley up there just trying to give it to everybody. Like, I, I, I think it all the time. And, and then our industry went to a big push where they started taking at events. They would do, okay, um, every speaker now we're doing 15 minutes, 15 minutes because... Yeah. Because, you know, the audience's attention isn't that great. Uh, you know? And uh, I'm sitting back going, it has nothing to do with the audience's attention not being uh, great. It has to do with the fact you're hiring sucky speakers. Yeah. And the same audience yeah. will go watch an Avengers movie at three and a half hours. Uh-huh. And do uh-huh. just fine, you know? Yeah. The yeah. Not the, but anyway. Right. Anyway. Right. So I get up there and speak and I was just nervous and I had the sniffles. I was like half sick. You know, I was nervous. I was sick. It was wild. But afterwards, bro, people stood in line to talk to me. And that that moment was like, okay, like, I'm really going to do this. I'm going to finish this book. I'm going to start trying to help people. I'm going to make content. I'm going to coach. I'm going to do this and that. That's it. That was the moment right there. So that was the first one. And there was like 400 people in the room, you know, so... It was Dude, you wanted something cool. funny. You wanted something funny. The first one, the first one I had ever done, um, like as far as like on a, a level of you know whatever, uh, was at the Westport Playhouse, I think, uh, what, what it was called. And I do what I do, whatever. I had made this product. Here, here's what's funny: if you think the audience gets mad when you sell from the stage, watch how mad they get when you have nothing to sell. And so mm. I would go to events and then they'd be like, so do you have coaching? Do you have training? Do you have whatever? And I'm like, no, no. And people would get mad. But I created way back. I created a five CD set called the successful mm. agent, right? Like the successful right. agent, five CD set. And it's so bad, man. It's so embarrassing. I can't mm. even believe some people have it, you know, anywhere. It's going to be blackmail for me one day. Um, but I remember doing this event and um, I got off stage and I'm still very new at this. I don't know what's going on. I don't whatever. And uh, I get bombarded and people are coming over and they're like doing whatever. And I'm just trying to get back to my table because I had I hired some people to come work the table and I was like going to instruct them on to make sure mm-hmm. how to sell the successful agent and everything else. Mm-hmm. And as I start getting closer, I'm moving closer to the table trying to move people over there. I look over and there's no... Uh, what's called on my table, none of the product. And now I'm starting, even though I'm smiling at people, I'm starting to get so mad. 
I'm like, are you kidding me? We're wasting this opportunity. We have all these people. We have all this. We're not even selling this freaking thing. Like, I'm trying to figure out how to monetize this business. Like, can we at least mm -hmm. all I created? So I get over there and I, I finally get over the table. And I'm smiling at people and do the ha ha whatever. And then I kind of look over at the first time. I'm like, oh, where's the course? You know, okay. Uh, and I'm smiling, whatever. And she goes, she goes, they're all gone. And I went, oh, I went, what? Like, what do you mean they're all gone? Like, and I'm like, and now I start thinking, because again, this isn't a direct conversation. This is smile, smile, one sentence, smile, smile, mm -hmm. one sentence. So now I'm the whole time it, while I go back to the conversation with people that I'm talking to thinking someone freaking stole our product. Like mm -hmm. I invested money in this. Like I did, you know, I'm trying to really make it here. Right. And so I tell this all whatever. And then I look over, I'm like, what do you mean they're all gone? Someone stole them. She's like, no, Jared, they sold. They're gone. And that was the wake up call to me. I was like, that was the moment because I was still selling real estate. And that was the moment when I was like, shoot, there's something here. You know, like, I don't know if uh, I got to figure this all out. I got to, you know, whatever. But there's something here. Like they're, they're responding, you know, to what I'm saying. They're responding. And I wasn't even that good. I don't think I don't I'm still figuring out my message, you know, whatever. But that was a wake up call to me. And then shortly after that, I think we were the first ones in the industry to create like a virtual coaching or a virtual training model, right? Because we have our one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. and we have our, our virtual coaching, a virtual mm -hmm. training model. And my God, man, when we created it first, it was so bad. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. when I say bad, there wasn't the technology we have today, you know, mm -hmm. to really like create these platforms or like do a plug-in or do whatever. We have people that are still in our virtual program that are still there today, all these years later that are paying $9 a month because they're <laughs> grandfather. they're grandfathered. Okay. Like they are. And I will never cut anything off from them because if there was a way that $9 could have been wasted or it was overpaying, whatever it was we created, it was probably uh -huh. should have been. Okay. It should have been more <laughs> $9 is probably too much, you know? So that all came well from those early days, man, like trying to figure it out Yeah. You know? or like just yeah. you know, here, what do we do there? Like, you know, everybody sees you now and it's just like, well, man, there was a, what was the, what was the, uh, I was talking to someone the other day and I said, you know, every farmer knows to create a great harvest, it takes a whole lot of crap, you know? And, and, you know, while we're all trying to do everything, mm. screw up certain amount of manure, you know, mm -hmm. is required. And so, you know, when you look at building your business, yeah. you look at screwing up, when you look at whatever, no harvest is ever built with a whole lot of crap. And so not only is crap uh, mm. something that's inevitable, it's necessary, you know? So don't don't be afraid of screwing up. Crap is part of the harvest. Mm. Yeah, and the more crap, the better. That's it, man. That's it. When I was a kid, that was the best smell in the world, driving by a farm. <laughs> When did you originally become an agent? When did you start this? Uh, I'm so, I'm going to be very, I'm so bad with time frames. It gets me in trouble in relationships and otherwise. I'm so bad. After 2000, pre-2000 or post? Late 90s? It was after. It was after because okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm 41 now. So I grew up, I grew up in the industry. My mother was an agent. I was, I was her unpaid assistant. Okay. Mm. Um, and so I think I officially got my license. I want to say probably just after 2000, um, mm. probably right around there. Um, I was doing, um, I was, I was working a job where I was in line to take over eventually actually it was a really good job, but I just didn't love it. And my, having seen my mother do real estate, I knew I loved real estate. And I was also starting to get into like investments and stuff. And I got my license literally just to save on commissions and have access to the MLS. And, mm. uh, and then I started getting like friends that wanted to like, you know, ask me questions and see things and, you know, whatever. And, you know, I realized that I really loved the business. I mean, I've been a part of it my whole life and I'm just like, I got one chance here. Do I really want to look back and say, Hey, I didn't do the thing that I loved. Right. I mean, Hey, I was successful in this other career. That's great. That's whatever. But you know, I'm, I'm really going to look back with regret. And, um, and so I just kind of put myself in a position where I said, I'm going to give myself six months to really try this at it, you know, try the real estate being an agent. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm uh -huh. going to give it, I'm going to give it the real, I'm going to go full time. Cause I, cause I got the license and then I tried to do it part time, uh, while I was working my other job 
And, uh, you know, I found out that even my best friends didn't want a part-time agent. They didn't want to hear that they couldn't get into a house because I was working my other job, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, that was a real wake up call for me. I'm like, even the people most loyal to me, when it comes down to it, they need to get in there first, you know, they need to. And so I just said, you know what? I had a certain amount of savings and whatever from my job. And I said, I am going to give this a real go. I'm going to give it six months. And you know how cyclical it is. I mean, the first three months, you know, you're looking at hot sheets and just trying to show things. And I mean, I can go into if you want to, like what I did, you know, to actually start creating deals. But like at that moment, it was just uh, I said, I'm going to give myself six months. Uh, and if it doesn't work, I can always go back to this. This is always there. There was a million places trying to hire me. Um, yeah. Yeah. The rest, as they say, is history. And then you started crushing it. What What was your biggest year? Simple, simple. So first off, when you say like, how do you crush it? Like. When I talk about visiting, no, 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 no. I said, I said, no. I said, then you started crushing it. Yeah, but that took that took. So let me think about this. So before I went team, so to say, I went those mm -hmm. first, you know, three to six months. You don't really have anything, right? And I'll give you kind of the progression, right? And I was looking at it, going, okay, how do I get clients? Because I'm young, I'm very young, I'm brand new, I'm you know the whole thing. And the same stuff we teach today, from a visibility standpoint. Uh, is the same stuff that I was teaching, you know, that I, that I was doing back then. Only it was that's when I was learning the principles I teach today. So back then, the newspaper was a big deal. And when I say visibility trumps ability, when I say communication one on one, it's not what you say that matters; it's what people hear. That's what I was leveraging. I started putting in newspaper ads because that's where everybody went. I know a lot of your people listening right now are like, "What newspaper ads?" That's where everybody went for real estate. Okay, and I started putting in newspaper ads that. I realized that I didn't need to actually have listings in order to draw buyers to listings. So I would right. put in ads that would say things like um, condo up to 250,000, up to mm -hmm. two bedroom, up to two baths, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I have a little whatever. I didn't have a condo, two bedroom. I said that there were condos available up to two mm -hmm. bedroom. And they were in our market. And so right. then I would generate hundreds of phone calls. And those hundreds of phone calls uh, would would start coming in and would would uh, they'd be like, well, where is it? What's whatever? I'm like, well, what are you looking for? And then I would just start scouring. Well, I got seven of them I can show you. And I just started leveraging as a buyer's agent, you know, these other people's property, right? And so then my first year in the business, I think I did, uh, I was actually with Remax and I did uh, Platinum, right? Which was over 250K, right? My average price point, mm -hmm. I think was about 200, 225 in the area, we weren't Connecticut, like people riding around on horses, um, you know, doing mm -hmm. whatever. We were like, you know, normal, you know, whatever, right? And so I went platinum uh, on on my my first year in the business. And then uh, my second year in the business, I quadrupled. Um, and then my third year in the business is when I started getting into team building. And I was like, mm. can't do this. And a team building wasn't really a thing back then. Like we were learning. Right. That's where our concepts yeah. come from now, because I was like, wasn't a thing like first off there weren't teams and if there was you just built a brokerage under a brokerage that was a team you right know, right right agents and hiring and whatever and uh yeah that was that was the beginning of figuring out how do i leverage myself because leverage is everything you know it's it's i got in to have freedom of schedule just like every agent but then you have no time for anything but you chose it and so it was still freedom mm -hmm. and uh i got to a point where i'm like okay, my kids were young and uh, I'm like, okay, or actually we're about to have kids. I shouldn't say kids were young. We're about to have kids. And mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, if this continues like this, I'm never going to a game. I'm never going to get to spend it. I'm never going to be able to, I'm like, but I have an insatiable need to grow. So what do we do here? You know? And there wasn't people like me and you that could teach team building or there was none of that. And so I just started mm -hmm. to figure it out. And in many cases, the wrong way, you know, and uh, and then we went, you know, and I started figuring it out and making mistakes and figure it out better and make mistakes and figure out better. And that's where a lot of the things I teach today came from is just been there, done that, you know? Yeah. That's great. So, so you, so you got into it because you were investing in real estate and you kind of yep. wanted to make commissions on your own deals. Yeah. Right. I want to touch on that before we get out of here you know, as far as like real estate investing, most agents don't own investment property. Like, you know, 
the horizon is like to be the top agent. Whereas in my mind, the horizon should be, be the top agent so that you can buy a bunch of rental properties and sell into the sunset, but everything else like, yeah, that's it. Man. But the, but, but, but the coaching part, right? Like when, when did you start that? How did you transition that? Do you still have a team in place that you make a percentage out of, or are you just completely out of that business altogether? Yeah, can't uh, lay it. that out for me. All right, so I'll lay it all out for you. Um, so first off, uh, investment side. I mean, I was on Flip This House. If you remember that show on A and E, um, you mm -hmm. know, like th those those guys are good friends of mine to this day. They run probably the largest um, real estate investment uh, coaching and training probably in the world, at least in the U.S. But uh, uh, those are still good friends of mine. But yeah, I started getting heavily involved in that because my theory, my, my idea, and what I, the things I teach agents today is that you know we're not just we're not just sales agents. We are sales agents, but we're entrepreneurs. And when you're an entrepreneur, you understand that you know multiple streams of income is part of your job. Like that, that's how you're healthy. That's how it works, right? And so I never looked at it as number of transactions. I looked at it: what can I use this for to leverage it to other things? Because you're the mm -hmm. center of the transaction for everything you do. Your database can grow larger than anybody. Your reach, you're the source of everything, right? And I don't think enough agents really look at it like that. And in my opinion, like I've, I've said this before, and it gets me a little bit of trouble, but people will remember it. If the only thing you're making money on, if your only source of income as an agent is, you know, the only time you get paid is if you get a commission. Well, you're a highly paid Las Vegas stripper. You got to do the mm. deed and get the money. Like that's, you know, that's mm. one source of revenue. If you don't have transactions, you're not getting paid. Well, that's a problem, right? And so yeah. I started looking at it that way. And I started looking at what else can I do and what else can I leverage this to and what else can I, you know? Um, and, and so, you know, investments were the next, the next level because it, I wasn't even using my own money. Um, you know, I had access to properties. I had the relationships. I had all of those things. Mm -hmm. I leveraged somebody else's money who didn't have the time to do it. And we split 50, 50. Right. And mm -hmm. so I started doing that kind of stuff. And then I grew and grew and won awards and was selling and built my team and, and, and was selling, you know, at a very high level. And that's when I started, when I started winning the awards. Uh, that's when I started getting asked, you know, when I was in Realtor Magazines, the first edition of 30 Under 30 and, you know, back mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. So I started getting asked to come and do events. Would you come speak to our whatever? I'm like, um, yes. They're like, what do you charge? I don't know. I was like $250. Like, I don't know. And I literally have no idea, you know? And um, so I started doing that. And then when I, when I started doing uh, the events, that's what I was telling you before. You think people are mad when you have something to sell from the stage. Well, try having nothing to sell. Then they get even more angry. You know, they're like, that's it. You just teased me and there's nothing more. You know, now you're really a Las Vegas stripper. And, and so, you know, it's like, it was like one of those things where like, I got nothing. Like, so I was like, oh, I got to create something. And that's when I created the course. And that's when I created the virtual training. And that's when I, you know, mm -hmm. and people were like, well, one-on-one, -on -one. We, no, we want one-on-one. -on -one. And that almost became one of the biggest mistakes of my life because I got into the one-on-one -on -one game, but I was one-on-one -on -one coaching. And okay. this is the mistake that many people in my position run into is that um, in order to monetize, they spend all of their time traveling around speaking and then one-on-one -on -one coaching people. And there's mm -hmm. low yeah. time to actually work on or do the thing that makes you who you are, to, to work on intellectual mm -hmm. capital, to actually think, to allow your brain to do what it does, to actually, mm -hmm. like, no time to do that because you're just traveling and and coaching and you know speaking and coaching and so three years from now you're saying the exact same thing because you haven't had time to actually so i booked out my schedule doing one-on-one -on -one coaching with people and to be honest i don't love that that's not what i'm great we have a great program we have a great director we have great coach that's not how i'm built like i'm i'm the head that flows it down i'm the content i'm the you know whatever and so then i started realizing shoot I got to, I got to scale. This guy scaled my team. I've got to, uh, I've got to create leverage here. So I started hiring coaches and I came with the pitfalls that come with that. We hired a lot of bad coaches that were weren't mm -hmm. fantastic, who represented me and made me mm, look. Yeah. Good. And then I got a few that were great, you know, and then I didn't mm -hmm. know how to create a program where we leverage the info I'm doing or how do we, you know, disperse information or how do we just all these growing pains, you know? Mm. And then, and then little by little by little, we grew and grew and grew mistake, 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 grow some more mistake, grow some more mistake, grow some more, just like any business. And, you know, we're finally at the point now in the last couple of years where like, we have a great director, our director of coaching sold her real estate business. So the things we teach people to do, she just did. 
Um, mm. You know, even while she was still selling and being our director, she had a house in Mexico. She moved to Mexico. Like the things we tell people we want them to learn to do, we're doing, right? And uh, I'm finally at the point mm. where we have a great structure. We, we know how to disseminate information. Um, we know what makes a great coach, what doesn't. We know how to switch people off when they're not. Uh, we know the difference between our virtual program and our one-on-one -on -one and who belongs where and what that difference is. Um, we're finally kind of, this is over 10 years or more, you know, it just took, and, 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 and probably right about when I missed that point, right before I did the one-on-one -on -one coaching myself, like actually was mm. getting on calls with people and doing, I think it was actually calls back then, um, mm. is when, uh, you know, I, I had to sell the team. My, my real estate team, because I, I couldn't sure. do it. I couldn't, not only could I not do it all, but even moving forward now, um, when it comes to um, uh, all of the brands I work with and all of the, I can't be a competitor. And then they're not going to put me up on their main stage when I have my license with, you know. Yeah. Here's a, here's a really quick story for you. You are now with EXP. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Glenn's been a friend of mine for years. Glenn came to me back when mm -hmm. he first was starting the company to talk about the mm -hmm. potentially be a figurehead, to potentially like, you know, push the brand, promote the brand and stuff. And uh, showed me the whole concept. It was him and Brad Anderson at the time. Showed me the whole concept, showed me the whole thing. And uh, I had to say no, because I'm like, for me, my vision of where I wanted to go and what I wanted to do, which was different than other people, that was career suicide for me. Because every mm -hmm. other brand was going to go, boo, no thanks. Yeah. And so what I, what I did from there was... And this is why we stopped selling on the stage. I don't sell on the stage at all. We just give people an email when mm -hmm. they get free training. We just build our database. Mm -hmm. Because the idea mm -hmm. to me, every event I do, it's about being uh, building our database large enough that we can be direct to consumer where we're not relying on anybody else. Meaning if any brand yeah. tomorrow says, we're not working with Jared James, big whoop, my database is bigger than yours. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like if right. anybody, like if, right. so now I've spent the last, five years, six years, just building that, building that and changing our course a little bit. Um, but in the beginning, we had that opportunity with EXP. I remember that and just had to kind of go, hey, can't do it while we're still kind of figuring out what we're doing, like what it looks like. But we didn't really figure out the coaching game till probably we got serious about it. Probably like, I don't know. And again, I'm bad with time frames, maybe six years ago, something like that. But we got really good at it probably a couple years ago. Um, you know, because of certain leadership and structure and, you know, it's just all figured it out, man, like every good business. So that's the kind of look back over the place, but yeah. Yeah. Do you look back at the EXP decision? Do you, do you regret that at this oh, not point? A, not in the least bit. No, I, I love, I love, uh, I love what they're doing. Like I said, Glenn's a friend, like it's, uh, um, but no, for me, for my, for my path, for my course, no, mm -hmm. it's the right decision. You know, I can't, I can't be beholden to any brand. I can't be, Yeah. you know, it's like, like I've seen what you're doing and that's fantastic. And I've got other friends that are doing things that, um, you know, they're now building their network within. And I think it's fantastic. Good for them. Like, you know, um, I just have a little different path, you know, mm -hmm. and I have a little mm -hmm. different, um, a little different death, my, a little different destiny, I guess, as far as the, the, the place that I'm going. Um, yeah. and I'm keeping as open. So we, the thing that's not focused on a lot is we've got, I don't know, five or six companies within our portfolio. We've got mm -hmm. one just acquired. I can't even talk about yet. Um, and so I'm doing things a little bit differently. Like I, I really do. Um, I'm purebred entrepreneur. Like I am like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm the mm -hmm. face of coaching, training for our business and speaking. And I do a ton of that, but a lot of it is a funnel, not only to get people into our coaching and training, but it's also a funnel um, for our offset companies of the other things that we do. Um, cause we're kind of building a little, little empire over here, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's mm -hmm. what I love doing, man. It's, and it's what I'm trying to train everybody else to do. It's like, you all can do this on some level, you know, yeah. visibility when you have the, when you have the database, when you have the funnel, when you're direct to consumer, nobody mm -hmm. tells you, you can do the options are yours. Yeah. Yeah. I was a little worried about that when I, when I moved over, um, your word about uh, the connection with EXP? Yeah, just the brand, you know, being brand agnostic versus, you know, being tied to a brand or whatever. But I don't I don't really talk about it a lot online. So it's kind of a lot of people don't even realize I'm there. And yeah. all my coaching stuff isn't really geared towards that. Um, 
you know, it's like, there's so many different streams and platforms of different things. Like EXP is like a very small piece of what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, you know, well, but I was like, a lot of stuff independently too, right? Like I, I see yeah. a, lot, a lot of streams, you'll do your own events, you'll do your, so you don't, you don't really, if that's the way I'm in the real estate investing world, I'm in the, you know, we got a CRM, we got, I mean, it, there's a lot of different things. Did you go into the slime business? I didn't know that. Well, no, not, not necessarily. We, we have a really good one and we're, 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 you know, we're bringing on customers and we're playing around with it. It's, it's connected to chat GPT and it's really cool yeah. and we're selling it left and right. And so now we're just like, okay, cause we're doing it. Cause like I had this company a while back and we grew too fast and then we overstaffed cause we grew too fast and then leads dried up and we were overstaffed with all this, uh, over overhead and it yeah. just crashed and burned and everybody was mad. Yeah. Well, you know, we're not going to, th this was a different partner, but, but you know, this guy saw the whole thing happen and we're just like, we're just doing it right. Are you white? And, um, what are you doing? Are you white labeling? Are you just it is, acting with it? Is, and that's, you we're know, leasing the software. We built, yeah. We built a CRM from scratch. Mm -hmm. Like literally I spent, we have, we have zero interest in doing that because yeah, as you should, by the way. So yeah. like, so like we built one from scratch and like, I don't think you realize what a game of Jenga building a CRM is. Every time you fix something, something breaks. So I invested literally millions, man. And we built this thing over the course of years. And, uh, uh, by the end, it was a great system, great whatever, but I just made a decision at the end. We actually scrapped it. We use it internally, but we took customers off of it because of, I had to decide again, vision and goal of where we wanted to be. And that wasn't the business I wanted to be in. And what yeah. I'll probably do is I'll take that source code from that because it's a great CRM and I'll probably end up taking it and going to one of our large brokerage clients or something and selling it to them and saying, hey, mm -hmm. you don't need to use this. You don't need whatever. Here, you have your own CRM. That's probably yeah. what we'll eventually do. But in the short term, I scrapped it um, just because it wasn't the amount of focus it was taking every day wasn't worth mm -hmm. what, what, what I was in that business for. It just wasn't. Yeah. wasn't worth it. But I could yeah, do it. We feel like. See, the thing with this is like the overhead is nothing, you yeah, know, my case. And, yeah. right. And everything is set up on, you know, production base. So like, we've got like, we've got like onboarding fulfillment sales, uh, you know, um, everything. You're not paying uh, the developers all, and stuff. No. Hell oh no. God, man. I had, I had a team yeah. of eight developers, uh, uh, working on this. I mean, jeez, you know? Now I own, I own right now two other tech companies. One I can't talk about, uh, one um that we launched because of the failure of a parent company from another thing but it's called first up f-y-r-s-t-u-p and that one we've got developers but it's nowhere near what the crm was and it's so much easier to deal with because mm -hmm. i just realized how convoluted a crm is but we've got one now that i learned a lot from that process and how much was spent and how much headache and how much you know all of that stuff that when I got involved and we launched this company first up, it uh, was so much easier. Like holy crap, um, just 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 a lot easier. But once you start getting into that world though of developers and everything, man, they're expensive. You know what? You know what? I re you know what's so funny is that I never used a CRM in my business. Yeah. <laughs> You know what? It's amazing to me because people will say that to me. Like a lot of a lot of top producers will say that to me, and they'll say, and they say it like a badge of honor, like a see that you don't need CR. <laughs> and my response, my what's going through my head whenever I hear that from any top producer when they're like, you know, I didn't use one, and they they look at that as evidence that they don't need one. Uh -huh. uh, my response in my head is always thinking how much further you could have gone. Mm. Uh, you know, it's not that doesn't that's not proof of concept. Mm. <laughs> so if I go right now, if I go right now and I run five miles with no shoes on, uh -huh. I'm not going to go, you know, guys, I run, I don't even wear shoes. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I'm going to come over and be like, Hey, that's awesome, man. Hey, maybe try out these Nikes. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like may maybe, maybe this is what we should look at right now. You know, yeah. you know, like, like maybe that's a good idea. And so whenever I hear that, it's so common because it just wasn't the culture to be using one. It goes against the personality profile of top producing people. Um, to be that organized and to be that, you know, whatever. Yeah. But I never look at it as proof of concept. I always yeah. look at this, oh my God, look how well you did in spite of. Mm. Like that speaks to the talent. It speaks to the drive. It speaks to all of that. But it also mm. speaks to how much more there was. In yeah. my mind, that's what I hear. Yeah. I hear that. 
Yeah. Well, I figured for me, I was like, I can only handle so many deals. I'm one agent. Yeah. I didn't do the team thing. So I know. Two two I two deals a week. For a while, by the way. I'm just gonna tell you, man. I thought that was mm. a mistake for a while. But it became your brand. It was like yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so maybe you can make the argument that you make it up in other ways, right? Like you say, mm-hmm. like, yeah, in a normal situation, yeah, you can do more with leverage, no doubt about it. But your brand kind of became that thing of like, you know, doing a hundred plus, you know, solo agent, the whole thing to where I was sitting back and I'm going, so how's he going to transition? You know, because he's not going to transition. Like, mm-hmm. you're going to have to. You, yeah. You're going to, you want to do other businesses if you want right. to step away, if you want to, if you want to, like, something's going to have to give here. You know what? I, I, I kept selling way longer than I should have to. Yeah. I could have walked away along a lot earlier, but, um, I was still like in it. I was still loving it. I was still making was, money. Was that, like, what was the reason? Was it fear of losing that income or was it? It was, that was a big part of it, but I still, I still didn't mind it. I was still having fun. You know, I'm still loving showing the properties and helping the people. Um, but that, but when I started to cringe, when my clients were calling, you know, I was like, this is it. And at, at our, I mean, that, that was 2022 or the end of 2021. Yeah. And, um, I mean, I was already making more coaching than selling at that point. Yeah. So I, I replaced the income and I took a hit on the income with, with leaving the sales behind, well, but making more, I thought you don't charge. What are you doing off of like affiliate deals and stuff? Yeah. Affiliate. Okay. okay. So there's, yeah. so it's one way or the other. So you're making it off yeah. affiliate deals and doing, yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Mm-hmm. That is, uh, affiliates. So you're, promoting sales. you're promoting a product. You don't have to service. Like it's okay. Dude, go listen to this. this. I use their employees as if they're mine. See, I don't, That's I don't important. want hundred employees. I don't want a hundred employees. Yeah. You know, I, I know guys that are doing like 30 million, a hundred million a year, 60 million a year in core sales and have businesses and millions of employees and stuff. I've got like three or four partnerships yeah. of companies that have a hundred, 200, 300 employees. Yeah. And those employees do whatever I tell them to do. Yeah. Like those are my salespeople. Those are my fulfillment for, team for, that's for affiliate for the affiliate agreement yeah that makes that's yeah. that's i mean that was uh that is and, the and then guess what i yeah, get a cut right off the top deal. i get a cut right off the top no expenses see they yeah. deal with all the expenses and the day-to-day and all the all the people now there is just a get a cut side. there is a flip side because i'm thinking of this in my head right now the only potential issue with that is that you're not going to end up with a saleable asset meaning meaning the trade-off and, See, the thing is, is, well, there's a couple things, right? I'll tell you the meat of it at the end. The front end of it is I make all this income so I can go buy assets, right? Okay. But, but the, on the back end, on the back end though, a lot of these affiliates give me equity, right? So like, for example, EXP, I've got several, several, several hundred thousand worth of equity that gave me, right? Um, this CRM, I'm an affiliate of this company, but right. we have already worked out a deal that if, if, and when this company is big and it sells, yeah. then I've already got my piece of that equity already carved out of that company. It's like, I get all the upside, but none of the downside. Yeah. You know, that's honestly, man, like that is, uh, I was literally going to say that next, that a lot of the companies that will reach out to me now and they're like, Hey, would you promote this? Would you promote that? Would you promote whatever? A lot of times we're coming back, depending on what the, um, depending on what the impact's going to be and, and how much of a, a push we know we can have. Well, we'll say, Hey, we want percent equity. We want, you know, whatever, like we're, I'm not interested in, you know, you giving me, I want equity. Like that's, that's, yeah. you know, if, if you want it that bad, that's where it's at. So, but you got to be careful with that too. Cause if you get it, if you own equity of a company that gets into trouble, right. You know? Yeah. And, uh, that's why I kind of like playing it like this. No employees possible upside, take the income, buy assets. Yeah. You know, that's a good way to flip it. If you're taking that income and then you're going and buying assets, that's a good way to flip it. Because to me, that was the, as I'm sitting here listening to you, that's the one thing I was thinking was, okay, so you've got those people you're sending over, you've got, but then you don't have a saleable asset at some point, mm-hmm. uh, which, which potentially could be a downside there. But if you're using it and you're just saying, Hey, but I also don't have the risk over here of these people, the headache that comes with that, the, believe me, I know that world. So I get it. Mm-hmm. Like, it's, it's mm-hmm. another way to do it without it. Dude, I go, I, I knock off at five. I go to bed at night just and sleep like a baby, right? I don't have any problems, right? Oh, uh, I wish I could tell you I never have any problems with uh, 
please, man. We we do have to deal with people and whatever, but that's part of the reason again why you leverage. Uh, usually, if something gets to me, if by that point it's a uh, it's a bigger issue than I want to deal with, but you know, it is what it is. That's just part of it. You know, as we as we wrap it up here, what's the best way to for an agent to go out and just build inventory right now, and how do they win those listings? Oh God, there's a loaded question. All right. So it depends on their, um, their personality because we teach a couple of different techniques, right? But it really depends on their personality. If you want to ask me the easiest go-to way right now, because obviously we can mm-hmm. talk about content and all these things, but a quickest, mm-hmm. easiest right now, probably I'll give you two things. Number one is just to leverage listings that are already in your area and they don't have to be your listings. Okay. Okay. So, so, um, when you start looking at listings that come on the market, right? Uh, we know statistically when a listing hits a market within 30 days, another listing hits that neighborhood within six months, two to three more hit that neighborhood. Right? So if I was a brand new agent right now, I just thought of another way to, uh, if I was a brand new agent right now, what I would be doing is I would be saving a, a search, uh, in the MLS as if I was a buyer. Okay. Cause the greatest way to get listings is to have buyers, right? So I would be saving uh, a criteria for whatever neighborhoods that I want to have listings in. I'd be saving searches as if I was a buyer, right? Because what's going to happen now? Every time a listing comes up in that area, who's going to be notified? I am, right? Now, we just said that within 30 days of a listing coming on, what happens? Another one comes on. Every time that search criteria, every time that listing gets sent to me and goes, new new listing over at blank neighborhood where you want one just came on, what do I now know is going to happen? Within 30 days, another one's coming on. So I would hit a multi-pronged okay. number one. Uh, I would. We have a letter called New Listing uh, Prospecting Letter. Letter goes out and it says, hi, so-and-so, just wanted to let you know your neighbor's listing, uh, your neighbor's property just got listed over at blank. Uh, not sure if you're aware, but your neighbor's property being listed may have changed your value. If you'd like to know how your value's changed, I'll be at this number till 6 p.m. tonight, whatever, right? That's communication 101. When I say your neighbor's property being listed may have changed the value of yours, they heard their value went up. I didn't say that. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I would just literally every single listing that comes on uh, that's in my area that I want listings, I would either mail that out, but I would also go take the publicly listed MLS sheets for that listing. Not my listing, by the way. I'm not saying it's my listing. It's it's, mm-hmm. it's publicly available information. I would take that yeah. publicly available MLS sheet and I would go walk that neighborhood immediately before the flyers mm-hmm. of the listing agent can get there. And I would just go to mm-hmm. each door and say, hey, don't want to bother you. I know people hate that, but your neighbor's property was just listed over a blank. And I thought you might want more information. And I would put my mm-hmm. hand forward because they always want more information. Okay. I'd say, mm-hmm. hey, thought you want my, uh, you might want more information that you can't find on the internet. So now I'm going to kind of like dangle the carrot a little bit. They're like, what can't you find on the internet? Right. They're going to start looking. Oh yeah, we were wondering about that. We saw, and they're going to start talking to you. Because as much as people don't want somebody knocking on their door, even more so they want to know about their neighbor's listing, okay? Mm-hmm. And so now while I'm talking to them, we're starting to familiarize, we're becoming friends. Now they think I'm normal, they're normal. I'm going to have two closes, very simple. One is going to be, hey, nobody sells a neighborhood like the neighborhood. Do you know anybody who I should be talking about who possibly wants to get into this neighborhood? Uh, and then my second one, once they answer that question, is exactly what I wrote in the letter. I'm going to say, hey, not sure if you're aware, but your neighbor's property list uh, being listed may have changed the value of yours. Would you like to know how it may have changed? And mm-hmm. I'm just gonna ask, and I'm going to do that house after house after house after house. In addition to the stuff that's going to be mailed out, okay? For a for a new agent or somebody just trying to create inventory, there's no mm-hmm. better, more quickly effective like get people in front of you than just leveraging the listings that are already there. Okay? Yeah. And I want to see them. They don't have to be. Excuse the dog. They don't have to be your listing, okay? Like it mm-hmm. doesn't, like you're not saying it's yours. It's publicly listed. Now it's just a matter of who gets to the to the uh, neighbors first because that neighbor's property is not owned by the listing agent, okay? Mm-hmm. There's one. Want me to give you another one? Yeah. Okay. Why not? I'll give you two quickies. The other quickest way right now to uh, to get uh, uh, potential sellers, potential whatever it is, potential buyers, potential sellers, which isn't leveraged enough, which I leveraged like crazy when I was an agent, is investors. Investors don't care who their agent is. All they care about is quick. They've got, yeah. you're, you're calling cash, is hard money lines of credit, okay? They close in 15 days with no contingencies. They do these kinds of things, right? So I would go to my local REIA, R-E-I-A. Uh, I would, I would uh, attend all of those monthly meetings, 
filled with people who have lines of credit through hard money lenders. And I would go to them and just meet one after another after another and build my list of investors and just say, hey, what do you do? What kind of properties are you into? And they'd be like, oh, I'm a buy and hold or I'm a flip or I'm a this or I'm a that. And I'd say, great, I'm an agent. What I specialize in is finding great deals for investors like yourself. You know, would you like me to add you to my list? Like whatever. Then I would have save criteria again in my MLS that use all those words. You know, the, the uh, uh, approval required, bank approval, uh, sold as is, handyman's, like all those words that all come in. Mm -hmm. And every time those properties hit the market, I'd be reaching out to those people within my database and uh, yeah. those investors are saying, hey, got one now. Do you want to go see it? Mm -hmm. The only rule is they buy it and they sell it. I'm the one who sells it, right? Right. Last but not least, the last thing I do is I would absolutely uh, leverage video. And, 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 and this is the one I would do. Every buyer I worked with, any buyer I was aware of in my office, even if it wasn't my buyer, if I got the approval of the person in my office to do this, I would do it. And I would make this video. I'd hold up the phone and I'd say, hey, everybody in so-and-so area, um, I've got a buyer looking for an up to three bedroom, up to two bath, 1,500 to 2,000 square foot home in the so-and-so area. If you or anyone you know is even considering selling, can you please let me know right away? I may be able to sell their home without it ever hitting the market. I would take that video right there. And I would promote it, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. 20 bucks, mm -hmm. 50 bucks, whatever you got. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would promote that in my area so that mm -hmm. all of these people in my area who don't know me, who do know me, whatever, I'm coming up on their phone, on their computer, saying, mm -hmm. I've, got, I've got a buyer in this low inventory market, an unable mm -hmm. to buy anything. But if you or anyone you know is even considering selling in this up to three bedroom, up to two bedroom, Please let me know right away. I may be able to sell their heart, their uh, their house without ever hitting the market. I would then take that video and promote it on mm -hmm. every buyer in my my office or that I work with, and watch what happens. People will start DMing you. My mom is over in blank. What price range are they looking? You know, my mm -hmm. I start reaching out. Notice I didn't talk about you know price or anything. Yeah, qualifying factors. I don't want to disqualify them before they ever get to me. I want them to talk to me and then mm -hmm. find out my people are outside the, but I might know, Hey, what do you, now I've got an opportunity, right? So I would do things like that, uh, on a regular basis, um, that actually are proactive in getting people to see me, know me, know what's going on and potentially work. That's great, man. So, so door knock and the, the new listings throw in something in the mail, well, video mail out. All out there looking for investors that might want to grow a great deal on a rental property and uh, doing the video, promote Build the video. Investor list, man. All investors care about is first come, first serve. Mm -hmm. Like, that's it. Mm -hmm. Guys, go on. I put this up on Instagram the other day. Go on, go on YouTube, go on Google, go type into Google, uh, you know, best agent in blank, best way to sell your house in blank. Don't care about the results, but scroll halfway down the page. You know what's going to say on the Google results? People also searched, and it's going to mm. give you about eight suggestions, okay? Mm. Go make videos. Make eight videos with those exact titles mm. because Google just gave you their algorithm. Mm. They're like, this is what we're going to return. Right. This you know? is what we're going to show other people that search this. Anything in this world, anything, like the type mm. of client you want, the type of it, whatever it is, type it into Google. Don't worry about the results. Go halfway down. Look at what they're telling you to put in. They're going, people also search, mm -hmm. go make videos with those exact titles. Mm -hmm. They're telling you, here's our algorithm. Go for it. Like, <laughs> have at it. It's, it's an absolute, like, that's gold for the right people. If they actually yeah. take advantage of it. No, that is gold, man. So where can people find all your stuff, bro? All your coaching and all that good stuff. Simple, man. So I was, you know, like you, I just tell people connect online. So if you go to connectwithjared.com, just go to connectwithjared.com. Mm -hmm. uh, you can uh, connect on all the social platforms. Uh, like you, man, I answer the DMs, as long as they're not weirdos. Uh, I answer the DMs. Uh, I think it's important. I think it gives us context of what's going on. And, you know, you know, uh, I think there's a lot of reasons why you and I both do that. So uh, follow on all the platforms. Obviously, our website, jaredjamestoday.com, uh, jaredjamestoday.com. We got a conference coming up in October in Nashville that, you know, really looking forward to put a lot of work into. Um, there's a lot of other things always going on, but uh, yeah, man, reach out anytime, you know? 
to listen to you to listen to go me. check out my guy jared james here jared james today.com connect with jared.com and if you guys are around nashville in october um go out and check out his event it's gonna be really really good man thanks for spending so much time with us today bro that was great, man. It was nice to actually talk about something, you know, other than the whole time, you know, what is the, <laughs> yeah. this is how I like to do it, man. I didn't have any questions ready or anything. I just, let's just have a conversation. So I don't do a lot of, I, I do my own podcast, but I don't do a lot of podcasts just for that reason. Mm. Cause it's the same questions over and over. Yeah. And I'm just like, I'm bored, you know, like it's just <laughs> <Yeah>. you know, <laughs> so. have your answers ready and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Cool, exactly. man. Hey, again, thanks yeah. bro. Appreciate All it, man. Right. See you bud.